Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Living in the Solution with Dr. Elena George. Today, I have a th- think we have a very um, enlightening and important show. We've all been living through the COVID epidemic uh, for over a year now. And when you listen to the media and you, you uh, listen to people who have framed this uh, situation, you would think that everybody's doing very well, that people are surviving and thriving as best they can, whether that be at home or different work environments, and we're just muddling through. But no one ever talks really about the psychological component to this. And I don't think a lot of time has been spent on it. We know that children aren't going to school in many states and college students aren't going to school. I I read an article recently, I'm an ear, nose and throat doctor, so I'm interested in children and their development. And because people are wearing masks, it's beginning to affect how children form their speech patterns. So there's a lot of fallout from COVID, which we really don't discuss. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the psychological aspect of the changing in our changes in our society and how that affects us. And more importantly, what we can do to take our power back and to get our mental health rebalanced. And today we're going to have Dr. Andrew Kaufman on. He's a natural healing consultant, inventor, public speaker, forensic psychiatrist, and expert witness. He's completed his psychiatric training at Duke University Medical Center after graduating from the Medical University of South Carolina. He has a BS from MIT in molecular biology, and he's conducted and published original research and lectured, supervised, and mentored medical students, residents, and fellows in all psychiatric specialties. He has qualified as an expert witness in local, state, and federal courts, and he's held leadership positions in academic medicine and professional organizations. He's run a startup company which developed a medical device he invented and patented. And I'm so pleased and honored to have you on the show today, Dr. Kaufman, because I think you're going to add a lot of light to this heated situation. So very welcome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. George. It's a pleasure to be on with you this morning. Well, thank you again for your time. Let's get started. You know, you know, when you think about all we've been pushed, you know, in our faces, everything's supposed to be peaches and cream and hunky dory. But how has the COVID pandemic, pandemics, in your opinion, affected people, people's emotional health? Well, I think it's had a, a very devastating effect. Uh, many people have been living in a state of fear now for over a year's time. And when you're in a state of fear, um, it affects your health in many ways. Uh, you know, your body is not functioning as well. Uh, your uh, fight or flight or stress response is chronically kicked in. And of course, this uh, means that your body is focused on immediate survival threats rather than managing its, you know, day-to-day health operations. It puts those things on hold and then this kind of depletes your nutritional reserves and puts you in a very vulnerable state. Um, Obviously, being in fear uh, has other consequences, and when combined with all the other stressors uh, which have been, been imposed upon us by the governments of the world, and these include lockdowns, um, in the United States, we have not experienced it this year uh, really at all, but um, for four months or longer, many countries in uh, Europe and Australia, New Zealand have experienced uh, substantial lockdowns, which have a very devastating effect. All of the measures really serve to separate people from each other. And since we as humans are very social creatures, we need our community, our interaction, we need physical affection. And so everyone is in a state where these uh, normal functions of living are now prohibited in official terms. So you could imagine that this is going to, you know, affect people in in every manner. And we see some outcomes uh, that are quite devastating, such as suicide uh, that are increasing right now. Yeah, I read that statistic and the the group of people seem to be the most affected are the young adults, you know, people from, I think, was it 18 to 25? And 
you know, I remember being that age, it seems like years ago now, but you're, you're have so much hope about finishing college, getting to your, your future life. And with lockdowns, that was taken away, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you could imagine what it would be like to be a young person right now, especially in that age range, range that you mentioned, because that's when you're on the cusp of your independence as a you know man or woman separating from your parents, you're emerging from the educational system, and it's the time for you to kind of claim your stake in the world and make a name for yourself and actualize all the dreams that you had while you're growing up. And people who are young and in this position right now are facing essentially the shattering of all their dreams because it's very difficult to imagine any kind of uh, future given the current circumstances. So we have, for example, on college campuses, essentially students are put in solitary confinement. They, If they're on campus, they're staying in their dorm rooms by themselves. They have to only attend limited classes, staying distant, you know, keeping their distance mm -hmm. from their peers, wearing masks all the time. They're often subjected to all kinds of testing and other measures which are violate the Nuremberg Code because mm -hmm. they're experimental procedures. And thinking about, well, well how am I going to have a career? You know, mm -hmm. um, what if I want to be an entertainer? Well, there's no music or theater venues that are have been open for over a year. You know, there's practically no sports. Mm -hmm. um, offices are shut down. And all the hopes and dreams and excitement of that period of your life are practically unavailable right now. And that's just got to have, you know, an extremely devastating effect. And we're seeing this in some preliminary data. Unfortunately, we can't know the actual number of completed suicides because they don't report that data in a timely ongoing fashion. But we do have several different studies that have looked at this issue and show very alarming findings. One is where they looked at the reason for emergency department visits. And this study actually predated the pandemic by a couple of years. It was already ongoing. And it was very useful to be able to analyze the before and after data. And what the most alarming finding was from that is that you had a really sharp rise in the number of op opiate overdose presenting to the emergency department. And I'm sure that we can assume that a certain portion of that, which would be difficult to tell, would be suicide attempts. Well, that's we also see studies from the CDC where they've surveyed adolescents and other age groups uh, about thoughts of suicide, and it has been remarkably increased um, in the wake of all these pandemic policies. Actually, I have a question about that. I mean, we're seeing younger and younger children with suicidal ideation. What do you think is the cause for that? It's because they're not being socialized with each other and that they're alone. I mean, is it social media? What is the thing that's driving them to feel poorly? I understand when you're in college, you have, you're, you're in that last level where you're coming to become an adult. But what, how does that work with a child? Well, I think it's, you know, very similar. It's just in a different developmental context because mm -hmm. one is, you you know, before this, kids had their normal experience, right, which mm -hmm. is they would go to school and they would be around all their friends mm -hmm. and their peers and that they would balance out some of the, you know, demanding or repetitive schoolwork with positive social interactions and they would be allowed to do all kinds of extracurricular activities. There would be sports, you know, band, theater, all this kind of uh, opportunities. And, you know, my children had this experience as well. They're um, currently nine and 12. And then suddenly, you know, you give the kids a break. Everybody stayed home from school and I'm sure that was a little bit maybe fun at first, but when school finally came back, what do you have and and how is everybody else behaving? So first of all, many people are scared to have their kids even play with other kids. Or if they do, they're told to keep their distance. They have to wear masks. At school, if you observe the school procedures, it, it's essentially run the same way as a prison mm. where everyone has to line up all the time. Uh, no contact is allowed. And then the, the face coverings are such 
a salient feature because aside from any physical health risks that occur with that, because you're essentially breathing in your own waste, mm -hmm. the psychological effects on, on younger children are really important because not only are they emotional, but they're also emotional, but also developmental. For example, there are various language cues that you get only from observing the mouth movements and, and the lip movements. There also are cues that you get about people's emotional state. In fact, um, happiness and disgust are very difficult to be able to tell without seeing the mouth, according to the scientific literature. Plus, you have the message that children are supposed to be scared of each other and that they're dangerous because they carry a dangerous germ or disease. So you have all of these things separating the normal social interaction. You have fear of the other and no outlet to basically engage in the normal social process and develop those social skills. And think about what it might be like if you're a young child and you have a strange adult come into your classroom, someone of authority, and you don't know them and they're wearing a mask. It's mm -hmm. like they are a de-identified person, almost, you know, like some kind of monster, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps if they exhibit aggressive behavior. Wow, that's amazing. I never even thought in those lines, in those terms, and it it's overwhelming. And I think it has consequential, consequential effects for society if this continues. Let's take our first break and come back. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Andrew Kaufman. He's a natural healing consultant, inventor, public speaker, and forensic psychiatrist. And before the break, I think you did a wonderful job of laying out the consequences for children. You know, this reminds me of when you think about other pathologies that, that go on where people, Asperger syndrome, for example, where people have a difficult time with emotions and being able to understand and, and feedback. We're actually creating people who are not going to have a good lexicon for being able to interact socially. Is Do you see that as an outgrowth of this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are really putting up major barriers to normal social and language development of the children. And, you know, even the language, you can't separate that from the social aspects mm -hmm. because it's one of the most important ways we communicate, even though a majority of communication may be nonverbal. You know, there's also something about being in the proximity of another person. And, you know, we, we realize that our bodies are electrical as well as chemical, right? We have EKGs and EEGs where we measure that electrical activity. Well, interestingly, the research shows that the, med the magnetic field of our heart, for example, can be detected uh, up to six feet away and has a, a clear boundary at that uh, point. And what is the distance that we're told to, to stay away from each other is exactly six feet. And you know that when you interact with someone in person, you have a different experience. It's mm -hmm. like you, you can feel their presence in some way, and it's not something we can exactly always put our finger on, but mm -hmm. you, you know that, that it, it affects the interactions you have. And if you can't feel that other person's presence, then it's almost like you're being alone in many ways. That's a really, it's very interesting the, the way you put that. I, it, it's like someone's aura, someone's essence, and you interact and from a cellular standpoint and a, and a psychological standpoint. Those are necessary, aren't they? When you would talk about people in solitary confinement, they come out emotionally damaged if you keep them in solitary, I mean, in a prison setting. This is kind of what we're doing to our entire society. And it's, it has physical consequences just as much as mental from what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even before uh, looking at prisoners, there's uh, time honored research on this subject where people were in a sailing vessel at sea for an extended period of time, for example, and they would almost always have a complete psychological breakdown and often um, have hallucinatory type experiences where they had, you know, beliefs that were outside of reality or had other 
entities, so to speak, that they were communicating, like hearing voices or seeing visions and, and things like that. So we know that it's extremely taxing on our emotional system. And of course, also, you know, we haven't talked about the physical consequences, but those are uh, present as well and substantial. So things like, I would think, heart issues, um, problems with your thyroid, your adrenal, things that really, you're once it's sapped, then you're kind of set up for these chronic illnesses, aren't you? Well, you know, if you think about what it's like wearing a mask, and I think that is one of the things that's the most devastating. I'm definitely concerned about the chemical hand sanitizers and mm-hmm. the quaternary amines that are used to clean surfaces and spray it all over the school all the time. But if you just think about the masks for a second, they obstruct breathing. So that impairs your ability to get oxygen and to get rid of CO2 and other waste products. You know, we don't often think about our breath as being a a detoxification method of our body, but this is absolutely true, right? Whenever we expel anything from our body, it's a waste product. Mm -hmm. We don't get rid of stuff that our body needs. And when we, you know, exhale carbon dioxide, it's a waste product for us. But there are other things that come out in that, you know, whatever gets stuck in your airway and gets filtered out by all those little cells and cilia, right, often comes out just like it comes out in our nasal secretions. And when we're not doing that, there are all sorts of consequences. So what I've seen firsthand from people is uh, various types of skin infections around the oral area and basically under where the mask would be, things like impetigo and perioral dermatitis. There are certainly case reports of pneumonia. And I know of one person that had to wear a mask for work and after three days developed pneumonia of doing that and then was able to switch to a face shield and recovered very quickly. We also... um, have heard testimony in a German court case from a neurologist that extended use of the mask, and this wasn't children, this was actually adults who were working, I believe, in a bank and were required to wear masks for eight hours continuously. Um, And this doctor actually had evidence from EEGs and other sources of brain damage from this prolonged um, hypoxia. So we're talking about effects that range from kind of nuisance conditions to very, very serious conditions. And it's really untested. We have no long-term safety data on this, and no one is looking at it too carefully right now. That's pretty shocking. I mean, that No one seems to be, and we're both scientists, but it seems like the medical and the scientific community is not focused on consequences at all. It's focused on control, in my opinion. These don't have, these this mandates for masks don't have any basis in medical fact. The virus passes through the pores, doesn't stop people from, as you described, getting sick, doesn't stop people from transmitting COVID either. What do, what's your opinion on why this mask mandate has become such, so pervasive and so authoritarian in its in its nature. It's even making people go after each other in public spaces if they're not people aren't wearing a mask. It's it's crazy. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's important to look at the context because we have grown up our whole lives, you know, with these types of illnesses being present, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about things like the flu and other, you know, so-called viral illnesses. And We've never been asked to do anything if we're healthy. We, no one has ever suggested wearing a mask. Um, the only time I've ever seen masks on people in the public were in China where they have horrific air pollution mm-hmm. and uh, smog, and, and that's a totally you know, different purpose. But even in the hospital, you know, uh, hospital personnel, we don't really even wear masks except for very rare things when someone has a particularly aggressive antibiotic resistant infection, and then they would ask you to wear a mask while you're in the patient's room. And then you dispose of it immediately because it's contaminated. So in the past, people who are healthy were never considered a risk to get anyone sick or to get sick. And we're never asked to quarantine. We're never asked to stay away from each other. We're never you know, asked to wear anything like a mask. And there were lots of studies on masks 
before this that showed, and I'm talking about randomized controlled trials in the real world, mm -hmm. that showed no benefit in terms of reducing illness. And as would make sense based on the pore size and what you said theoretically, uh, but that was that would be, you know, if we actually had evidence of contagion, which is kind of a different issue, mm -hmm. but 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 important and related. So suddenly, in in the context of this hyped up, you know, pandemic, we have a complete reversal of all these health policies. Whereas in the past, we would say if you were sick to stay home in quarantine. Now we're saying if you're healthy, stay home in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past, we would say there's masks won't help you. <laughs> now they're required uh, for everyone. And there's no evidence whatsoever to support it other than some computer simulations, which can be tweaked to show anything, just like they were tweaked to predict, you know, millions of deaths, which never happened. So there has to be another purpose to this. And, you know, I feel that it's a sinister purpose. If you look at documentation from various organizations, you'll see that many of the policies that are moving forward are part of a bigger agenda. And you might see how the mask is an excellent tool of controlling people and of initiating them into a different reality, the so-called new normal. In fact, in initiation rituals for all kinds of groups and clubs, including um, fraternities on college campuses and other, you know, uh, secret societies like Freemasons, etc., and even in religious rituals, the mask is used during the initiation ceremony. And what it does is that it erases the, the prior identity, um, allowing for the new group identity to take place. And I believe that that is a major part of the reason for this requirement at present. And it's related to this economic reset or the great reset, as well as um, the shift to a new cultural normal that was echoed by virtually every politician around the world beginning last summer. And when you have people walking around with their faces being covered, they're essentially de-identified. You know, we have always traditionally associated this with antisocial behavior, such as robbing a bank. Mm -hmm. And in many jurisdictions, it's actually illegal to go out in public with a mask. But this, you know, de-identification allows people to behave in ways without the normal accountability. And that's why I think you have seen sometimes people behave you know, very egregiously around, you know, conflicts about this mask in particular. Wow. Well, let's take our second break and, and think about that, because this is, I think, the stepping stone. I'm curious to know how we went from a free society, technically, to this go along, get along. Uh, so let's take our second break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Andrew Kaufman. And before the break, you did, an, again, uh, just a, a wonderful job of explaining the bigger picture and the de-identification of society. And if you're not an individual, then your pursuits, I mean, I just find this is like a continuum from, let's say, the Affordable Care Act, where it was the good of the many outweighing the needs of the few. That seems to be the, the, the theme that underpins everything. And I've heard people say, and I'm sure you have too, that they want to help society. They want to just acquiesce because it's good. It's for the good of their of the world, of their fellow man. And it's actually, I'm not sure the good of it is you putting yourself on the altar of freedom for everybody else when the ultimate goal is to control everything. So we went from people not wearing masks at the beginning of this to maybe 90% uh, using it and going from people live and let live to people being attacked physically, verbally, if they don't seem to, to um, go along with the program. How do we end up in this kind of a groupthink mentality from, it's a really, it's not American in my opinion, it's anti-American for us to move in this direction. Yes, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, this is uh, really part of a long 
planned agenda and the way that I would view this in terms of the, cult, uh, the cultural philosophy, because I think that's one way we could describe what you're talking about. You know, our nation in the United States, at least our impression of this, is that it's based on individual liberties. And with, of course, individual liberty comes great responsibility. And so if we were faced with a deadly um, health risk, then it would be up to the individual to protect themselves from that risk, right? And this is really the philosophy that I grew up with and thought was part of my experience. And so, for example, if I believed that there was a dangerous, deadly virus and I didn't want to expose myself and my family to it, I could simply make the choice to stay home mm -hmm. and I could, you know, order things delivered and, um, you know, be very careful. And other people who had different concerns could decide what level of risk they want to take. Or just like you can decide if you want to ride a motorcycle or if you think that that's too risky. But what's happened is that there has been a, a cultural shift and a big push. And this is something that has been done on purpose and planned. And I suggest that you start with the work of Edward Bernays if you want to understand how this kind of manipulation can occur uh, through, you know, so-called public relations, which is really propaganda renamed. But you have the shift towards from this individualist philosophy to what may be termed uh, communitarian uh, or collectivism or even communism by some, which states that the good of the group takes precedence over the good of the individual. In other words, that you should be willing to give up your personal liberties in order to serve the greater good. And this is the philosophy that leads to um, people accusing those not wearing a mask of harming them. And also this has been applied to vaccines, that if you're the parent of a child who's not vaccinated, that you're putting the other children at risk. And this, first of all, doesn't really make sense from a medical point of view, but also, you know, why do we suddenly have this responsibility towards others in terms of being responsible for their health? Now, if this type of philosophy it becomes more entrenched in our society and more accepted and complied with, it can have devastating con consequences uh, because it is anyone who is in the minority viewpoint is going to be subsumed by this communitarian argument. And it's almost like a more severe form of what democracy really is. Now, I know democracy is a government system that we all believe is a free and fair system. And we've been told that we live in a democracy, but actually we've never lived in a democracy. Um, we've, we've lived in uh, a really an oligarchy, but officially it's a republic. But a democracy, which is majority rule, would essentially be a devastating system unless everyone agreed on everything, because any min minority opinion on any issue is, is going to be overruled, then minorities are always going to be marginalized and oppressed in that system. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with this communitarianism or collectivism type system. Yeah. You know, we take a step back. That's a great overview. And you mentioned at the beginning of the show about the Nuremberg Code and about this emergency use authorization, for example. None of the things that they're putting out there is scientifically vetted and true. And there's been a huge movement towards scrubbing any dissension, whether that's from the internet, whether that's from public discourse, you know, you're somehow abusing somebody else now, they're shutting people down from having an opinion or a thought. But again, the science community has just been, I think there's more people speaking up, but initially silent and allowing the powers that be to pronounce what truth is, what science is. And that, that whole theme of follow the science, <laughs> when it's really not science, it's amazing. It's all about language. And again, from a psychological standpoint, how much power does language have in pushing this, this, uh, this movement? New normal, that's a ridiculous statement. Um, you know, it's a bunch of oxymorons put together and 
platitudes and I just keep saying it over and over again. What is it? If you say it enough, it becomes truth. Absolutely. I mean, language is of paramount importance. And in fact, language itself may have, even in its origin, uh, been somewhat of a tool of manipulation because, you know, it's, we have other ways of communicating. And, and uh, you know, if you look at all the animals, we're the only ones with a language. So it's quite interesting. But you can see how important it is in so many ways. For example, recently they've changed the definition of vaccine mm. because they want to incorporate the genetic experimental uh, therapy that they are now trying to require in many uh, venues. So we also have the meaning of the word germ, for example, that has been completely inverted. Germ means a new budding or growth, like when we germinate seed to bring forth a new plant. And this has been turned upside down to describe a deadly microscopic organism that invades our bodies to kill us. So all of these specific things about the language, um, especially when you hear a term repeated over and over again, those are really for the purpose of programming people to accept some new condition. And by the way, there's a whole field of study on this because you can see that many, many words over time for various purposes had their meanings changed. So you can, in fact, look at old dictionary definitions of words and compare them to the modern definitions. And there's one uh, word that's extremely interesting in this and, and maybe a little controversial, but I think it's very appropriate to discuss in this context because this words meaning was changed around World War II and the rise of Nazism, which has a lot of parallels to our current situation. And the word is racism. If you look back at older dictionaries like the 1828 American Heritage Dictionary, for example, you'll see that racism was defined as taking pride in one's uh, you know, race or, or national group. So for example, something like the St. Patrick's Day Parade, where people, you know, are proud of their Irish heritage and have all kinds of displays of that would be considered racist under that old definition or the original definition. And obviously that's something that's encouraged, right? Because we still have St. Patrick's Day parades and other type of parades where people express pride in, in the group that they belong to. Mm -hmm. But during, you know, the beginnings of World War II, this definition was changed to mean, you know, scrutiny or unfair treatment uh, of someone based on their nationality or race. And that's a very, very different. It's the opposite meaning. And you can see how now we are in a culture where we are told and that racism is a very uh, prominent and negative aspect of our society. And, he, and just putting that out there by itself encourages people to adopt that viewpoint. Um, but it really serves as a tool of dividing people against each other. And governments have done this since ancient Rome in order to conquer and manipulate people. You have to know your history. Otherwise, you're doomed. I mean, that, that euphemism is quite true. You're doomed to repeat it. And they have this now on steroids because you can scrub the internet, not allow people to listen to things on YouTube, even find web pages, they're just scrubbed completely. So the ability to go and do your research is being compromised as we go. Because when people listen to what you just said and really hear it, then they can they realize that this is not my thoughts. I'm being told to think a certain way. And I'm it's like a button you push, like a Pavlov response. You say racism, you're automatically the worst person in the world. It's all color based and it's against what we've trained and how we grew up. Martin Luther King, for example, was about content of character. And we're thinking now in terms of color of skin, everything is based on how you look. And for white and black, for example, for Asian and non, this is ridiculous. And it's, it's the six feet rule that you're going to put in place just from a mind standpoint. They don't even have to mandate anymore that people stay six feet apart, do they? If you're going to do it to yourself, they don't have very little work to do, don't they? 
Well, you know, these behaviors have been really conditioned and conditioning, which is, you know, like Pavlov dog, Mm -hmm. a way of changing and manipulating behavior is much more effective when people are in fear. And now we have these behaviors like you described are essentially conditioned into the general public for the most part. And so it is an automatic behavior now, and it's going to be more difficult to reverse. It seems like the intention to change into this new normal has largely been successful for most people. And I'm glad you brought up this censorship because this is something that we need to be extremely concerned about. And I think people brush it off. But what we're talking about here is that various platforms that exist to disseminate information, you know, things like YouTube, are not censoring hate speech or snuff films or things like that, Mm -hmm. but scientific presentations. Now, you know, I've had many scientific presentations, and I'm talking about the same style of a, a slideshow presentation that I've given to academic organizations, right, for grand rounds. No different. The same exact way of presenting the data and interpreting it. And it's been removed from YouTube for violating some kind of policy. There Mm -hmm. was another doctor, uh, a pulmonologist, who actually had two papers published in peer-reviewed journals about alternative treatments uh, for the so-called COVID pneumonia. And he made a YouTube video just describing his findings in his published paper. And that was taken off YouTube. So we're talking about the ability to have a scientific debate and looking at the scientific evidence is extremely compromised. And at the same time, you have the mainstream media presenting misinformation Mm -hmm. and in some cases outright lying. I've seen several media outlets who have reported, for example, that the genetic experimental vaccine has been, quote, approved by the FDA, and that could not be further from the truth. You mentioned the emergency use authorization in the context of the Nuremberg Code, and that is a crucial, critical point to examine because these diagnostic procedures, including a PCR and any other antibody or antigen test and any of the experimental genetic vaccine treatments from Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, or any other manufacturer are all experimental. Not one of those has been approved. They've all received what's called emergency use authorization. And in normal circumstances, that would, be, that would mean that someone is on the verge of death and there's no known treatment and you give the emergency treatment. It doesn't mean that you take a healthy population um, who has no clear risk of anything and give them an emergency use authorized treatment. That That is against the spirit of it. But if you just look at the letter written by the FDA giving this authorization to the companies, you can see that they have no proof that it's either safe or effective. They make a statement saying, quote, it's reasonable to believe, quote, that it may be, quote, safe and effective. That doesn't mean anything. That means that the testing hasn't been done to make a determination. And it's experimental. And we learned after what the Nazis did, experimenting on their citizens, that we decided as an international community, we were not going to ever allow that to happen again. And that's what's happening right now across the world, unfortunately. And, you know, the question, I, I you, you said a mouthful, totally correct, but most people may not know that there's no liability for these companies. You know, that's part of their extension of the emergency authorized use, that no one can be sued if something goes down, if you have a bad outcome, if it didn't work, oh, well. I mean, <laughs> that's just unacceptable. And then someone to tell you you have to do it to travel, to go into a supermarket, to live your life, That's totally unacceptable. You know, let's, we have a small break and we want to come back because I want to find out from you what we can do emotionally to to break this because it's so overwhelming for so many people that I don't think they know where to start. So let's take our last break. You're living in the solution. 
Welcome back to Living Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Andrew Kaufman. And before the break, I think you did an excellent job of describing the consequences of a system that's not for humanity, in my opinion. It's it's anti-humanity. It doesn't matter what color you are. We're all going to experience this, whether we decide to fall in and take this vaccine, for example, I should say gene therapy, or those of us that don't want to. It affects the entire community. How can we break this? I mean, they've already stopped the, the, the misinformation campaign is in full effect because they've shut down any true opposition, any scientific based research is being poo pooed or just or just scrubbed. People, unfortunately, believe this is sometimes believe that this is FDA approved. But how do we break them out of this logjam? And for the most part, even more importantly, for people who don't subscribe to this, how can they protect themselves? How can they speak in a manner that won't get them hurt? <laughs> it's kind of a big question. But you have to take your power back. If you acquiesce, then we all lose. So how can we make our voices heard in a conscious way? Well, I, I really appreciate you talking about that acquiescence is definitely not the way uh, to approach the current situation. And you really need to summon up some courage here. And of course, most people are in some kind of hypnotic spell and that you're not going to be able to reach them. And it's up to them to go through some process to become open to seeing what's really going on. But I'm going to assume that anyone listening to this broadcast has already arrived at that point. And so I'm going to really talk about the people out there in that situation. And I think the most important thing that you can do is, first of all, look at the question of, is there even a virus at all? And a, a simple way to go about this would be actually to go to my website, and there's a page on there called the Statement on Virus Isolation, or SOBI. And it is written in such a way that you don't have to know all the scientific jargon to understand it. It's very common sense, and it explains how they have not actually even shown the existence of a virus that could cause any disease. Once you can see that truth, which is actually quite a bit easier to understand than trying to make sense of the number of deaths or the death certificates or the science of the vaccine or the science of the masks, because those are all argued both ways because there's not conclusive, uh, you know, not as conclusive evidence as with the virus. With the virus, it's very straightforward. Either there is one or there isn't one. And once you see there isn't one, you can immediately understand that all of the other things built upon it are false. And this makes it very, very simple to know what to do next, because you know that you're not going to consider a vaccine. You're not going to wear your mask anymore. You're not going to avoid other people, uh, let them avoid you. And you're not going to go along with any of the other policies. And the only way that you are going to be able to protect yourself and contribute to others also being protected from the tyranny that's currently upon us that is going to only accelerate over time is to make your choice as an individual to simply not go along with it any longer. And there are risks and consequences with these decisions, but if you don't take these risks and deal with these consequences now, it's going to be much, much worse in the future, and you're going to have no ability to make these decisions. So in my life, for example, I've done, I've taken my children out of school and I homeschool them now, and I've networked with other families who are doing the same, and we have ways to get them together and socialize and do group learning without separating them or masks or exposing them to harsh chemicals or anything like that. Um, you, what I've done also is I essentially let myself be fired for refusing to wear a mask for my regular doctor job. I've given up my medical license and I've moved into making a living based on true natural healing. 
and uh, working for myself so that I'm not sub subject to any employer that will require me to or ask me to do anything that would be unfair or unwanted. And I think we can all look to do this kinds of things um, to become more independent so that we can function outside of the system. And we have to summon up the courage to go into the grocery store and other places and show our naked smiling face and show other people that they can do this as well and risk the scrutiny because it's the right thing to do and it's the only thing that we can do to save ourselves. Well, that's, yeah, I, I applaud you and I'm, I'm honored to have you on the show because it's about withdrawing your consent. You have to believe this, that you're worthy, that God is in control of your life, in my opinion, and not men, not the government. They're hurting us. This is not about our safety. It's about controlling us. You just described for the last hour all the things that people needed to know in order to take their power back. If you choose to do this, this is, I guess everybody has free will, but this choice is not going to make you happy. We're seeing how this is affecting us. It's not healthy from an emotional, economic physical standpoint. And I just thank you so much for coming on. It was just an eye-opening conversation for me. I, I feel even more empowered to continue to do what I'm doing because we took a Hippocratic oath. I'm, I'm sorry that we lost you as a, you know an MD per se practicing, but we gained you as somebody who's going to help people think outside the box and actually be more healthy. So how can people find your website and follow you? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that. And, you know, I envision a, a new health system that is really based upon real healing and curing illness and not, you know, manipulating people and keeping them patients for the rest of their life. Um, people can find me at andrewkaufmanmd.com. That's Andrew, K-A-U-1-F-M-A-N, one N, MD, like medicaldoctor.com. And I have a new true healing webinar series where people can actually interact with me individually and talk about their health concerns or ask any other type of questions. And I also sell a trace mineral supplement harvested from the Rocky Mountains called Sheila G, which is an excellent uh, way to improve our health and um, resilience. So please look me up at those places. And of course, you can find uh, lots of videos uh, and interviews there as well. Dr. Kaufman, thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to have you come back so we can talk about the natural healing side of this. Because we talked about the problem, but we are the solution. And your example of you have to be brave. And you must feel so, I don't know, empowered and free now that you're not constrained by a system that worked against you. Well, you know... I absolutely do feel that way, but it is a time of much turmoil and, uh, you know, separation from other people and seeing that other people around us are not having this experience. So it, it's a mixed blessing, but as more and more of us choose to go in this direction, I think that we can have an amazing future. On that note, we need to stop it. Thank you once again for your time and energy and everything you do. And thank you everybody for living in the solution. Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Liberty Talk FM.